الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله. Sunnah of the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم that when the women approached him and asked for a glass for themselves without men, he responded. And he was not limiting the scope of what he would address with them. So he didn't say this is what we'll be talking about. He did not tell them don't ask about this issue. They were asking all what they need. He was answering all what they want. So, but in the discussion, I found that most of us need a lot of learning when it comes to family issues. And family is where we build a community. We start with two people getting together, marrying each other, beginning with children, raising children. That's where a community starts. So I found with uh, my sister, Iman, sorry, that your desire is on this issue. So that's why we chose the issue based on your suggestion. Family issues can be as broad as Islam in its totality, and it can be as limited as we make it to, to be. So I chose to address this issue through an extended period of time, like one piece at a time, in a series of lectures, so that you get a chance to learn about the theory behind the family issues, and you get a chance to discuss practical issues, and you get a chance to ask your own questions, whatever those are, whether they are your own personal questions, or the questions that you relate on behalf of somebody else. Okay? So inshallah, we will start with, uh, I chose the topic of the foundation for a happy Muslim family. What is a foundation? A foundation is the first layer you lay on the ground to build a structure. That's called the foundation. So what is the first layer on which we build our family? I believe that the first layer is understanding what we're building. To understand what the family is. And to understand the components that constitute the family, the elements that constitute the family. A man married a woman, together they constitute family. With children, it becomes a full-fledged family with future generation included. So what we're talking about is that if these are the components of the family, what is the foundation? What do we base it on? Like when somebody comes to marry you, and I don't know who's married or not, it's not an issue, but when some man goes to marry a woman, her family, her father in particular, gives her to him in marriage, he says, زَوَّجْتُكَ ابْنَتِي فُلَانَ عَلَى كِتَابِ اللَّهِ وَعَلَى سُنَّةِ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ I give you my daughter, so and so, on the basis of, on the foundation of the Qur'an, and the Sunnah. So the Quran is the primary source for the foundation for the family and the Sunnah comes to supplement it, to complete it and to explain it and to give us examples. So what we're talking about is that yes the family is not based on anything else but the Quran and the Sunnah. Vis-a-vis -vis what? Like, if the Qur'an and the Sunnah are taken away, so what is left to become the foundation for the family? Like, what about those who are not Muslims? What are they basing their family foundation on? What are their foundation? They are basing their foundation on either a source that substitutes for the Qur'an and the Sunnah, or else they are substituting it on my whims and my spouse's whims. We are free agents for our own self. We set our own foundation. We set our own guidelines. And as such, we continue to be free agents. So what is the problem with that? The problem with that is when two people get together in a company and they agree to live and manage the company, company by their own whims and desires, what happens to the company? Can they last for long? They can't. So there has to be a binding common principle and source of guidance 
so that the family stays together. What happens when the man wants to run everything by his whims and desires? And the woman wants to run everything by her whims and desires? Could we call this a real family? No. First of all, they have not paired together. Because marriage in Arabic means pairing. To pair, which means you pair a man with a woman. Together they constitute a family. So alone and separate, we cannot call every individual a family. They are not. So what binds them together? What makes them connect together is this common bond. Both believe in one reference and one source that becomes the guide, the campus, and the direction source for the family. That has to be clear. Okay. So the foundation is the Quran and the Sunnah. It means that it is not up to the whims and desires of either party. Not even the in-laws. The in-laws have nothing to do with this, except that they are to be treated well, and they ought to protect, support, and help nurture this new foundation and this new family. Right? So we have to define our relationship as a controlled relationship. What do we mean by controlled relationship? It means that if either party runs out of control, runs away from the parameters that makes the family family, then the family starts to shake. So if I insist to do things my way, despite your opinion, despite your views, despite the Quran and the Sunnah, I am literally destroying the family. Even generally in our faith, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, لَيْسَ بِأَمَانِيِّكُمْ وَلَا بِأَمَانِيِّ أَهْلِ الْكِتَابِ مَنْ يَعْمَلْ سُوءًا يُجْزَ بِهِ It's not up to your wishful thinking or the wishful thinking of the people of the book. He who does evil, he will be recompensated accordingly. So that Allah wants us to live not by our, our own whims and desires. In fact, there is an ayah very striking and very strong to deter us from wanting to live by our own whims and desires. The ayah is in Surah al jathiya Surah, I think, number 45, ayah number 23, if I'm not mistaken. I hope I'm not mixing them up. But in this surah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, أَفَرَأَيْتَ مَنِ اتَّخَذَ إِلَاهَهُ هَوَى Have you seen to the one who has taken his whims and desires as his own God? وَأَضَلَّهُ اللَّهُ عَلَىٰ عِلْمِ And Allah let him go astray despite the knowledge he has. وَخَتَمَ عَلَىٰ سَمْعِهِ وَقَلْبِهِ And he sealed his hearing and his heart. وَجَعَلَ عَلَىٰ بَصَرِهِ غِشَاوَةً And he put a barrier and a cover over his sight. فَمَنْ يَهْدِيهِ مِنْ بَعْدِ اللَّهِ فَمَنْ يَهْدِيهِ مِنْ بَعْدِ اللَّهِ Who else would guide him other than Allah? Where does he get guidance? If not from Allah, so living by my own whims and desires leads me to what the Quran and the ayah references very clearly as shirk. You know how repugnant the word shirk is in every Muslim's eye and heart? This is shirk. Living by my own ways is shirk. I am equating myself with Allah. And above that, I am giving myself more precedent over Allah's judgment. So this crosses the issue of kufr into an issue of shirk. Shirk means worshipping myself. So self-worship is a shirk. And I am repeating this because it is very prevalent both in our community and in other communities. Muslims and non-Muslims alike. Everybody wants to be the God of his own self. Let's be honest. 
I want to do everything my way, right? But if I do this, I don't belong to Muslims because it's contrary to being Muslim. Muslim means I am a submitter to Allah. Whatever he says, I submit to it. That's contrary to whatever I want, I do. Why am I emphasizing this issue in the beginning of this kind of program? Because it causes destruction of the family. And I want you to take the time to read this ayah in Surah Al-Jathiya and to take it to your children. Take it to your husband and speak about it. What does it mean to be a mushrik while I am a Muslim? Don't you think that these are something strange I'm saying? In Surah Yusuf, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَمَا يُؤْمِنُ أَكْثَرُهُمْ بِاللَّهِ إِلَّا وَهُمْ مُشْرِكُونَ The vast majority of people do not submit to Allah without committing shirk. They submit to Allah, but with shirk. And that's why if you read the other ayat, carried to us by all the prophets, including Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa the repeated, most repeated ayah on the tongue of prophets in the Quran is, اعبدوا الله ولا تشركوا به شيئا Worship none but Allah and associate none with him. So that issue is central. Why? Because it becomes part of the package of the foundation of the family. When we say Muslim family, it means submissive to Allah. Any submission that is polluted with shirk, it undermines submission itself. Why is this important in the context of family? Several reasons. One is, this is one very important principle to teach our children before they become adults, before they become in the age of marriage and responsibility, they need to know that yes, our Islam could be polluted with our shirk as well. Unless we understand the two and separate the two from each other and be clear that being a Muslim means I am someone who would never engage in self-worship or worship of anything or anyone other than Allah. In the shirk arena, some people worship their money. Some people worship their spouses. Some people worship their children. Some people worship their possessions, house or anything. What does it mean to worship all of these? What it means is when you are faced with a choice between being obedient to Allah and to be good to your family, you put this first. When you are required to either exhibit the values that Allah wants you to hold on to and living by your own invented values and priorities, you give your own self-imposed priorities, you give it your attention and your priority. Those issues are really very serious as a foundation for a peaceful family. Why? Because if we live together, as I said, and we have a reference that we can all go by, and the easiest example to give you is, why do people make less accidents today in the road? Because everybody who gets a license, he signs to be bound by the rules he learned in the driver's license book, right? What if we do not hold those guidance and rules and regulations up? What happens? Nobody's safe. So the only reason we are safe and trust the road signals to help us all act properly is because we are all submitting to one rule which is the rule of traffic. How do we govern ourselves in the streets, right? The only way we can sail safely in this life from birth to death is to follow one book of guidance that all of us 
are bound by. All of us accept, all of us submit to it, all of us, all of us use it as a reference. Then we are all safe. So the husband goes home and something is bothering him and he may be very angry at someone else. Why should he feel that he can throw all of his anger at his wife with impunity? It is because he knows that the wife is fearful. She wants to protect the marriage. So they start, some men, I don't say men, some men take the wife for granted that he can throw a mountain of anger at her, feeling very safe. But it is the same person. If a policeman stops him on the way home, he would never show anger, let alone throw his anger at him. Why? Because he knows the consequences. So even when we know the consequences, if we do not abide by the rule, then those consequences will catch up with us. I will get a ticket, I may go to prison, right? I may get points, I may lose my license, right? But with my wife, she's okay. She can take the pain of my anger and she doesn't have to respond because I am taking her for granted. I'm not telling you rebel against your husbands. Far from it. All what I'm saying is, I'm giving an example of an attitude that results from the lack of respect for the foundation and the rules and the guidance that govern our relationship. That's the point I want to get across. So it's not that I'm promoting that men are bad, women are angels, or the opposite. That's not the issue. So all what I'm saying here, the foundation that will give us peace and happiness in the family is that we constantly review the law that guides our life. Why? To give us the right perspective about the issues that we are handling. So a husband says to his wife something and she is not happy, she thinks he is wrong and he thinks he is right. What do they do? They go back to the foundation. The foundation is the Quran and the Sunnah. And if they cannot get the rules relevant to the situation on their own, they seek knowledge from scholars or references or imams. Right? But if we insist to live by ourselves, and many of us do it because we're afraid that our family will be on everybody's tongue. But that fear should never stop you from seeking guidance. When our cars do not run, we don't say, I'm not going to go to the mechanic. Because the mechanic may tell me, how did they give you the license? No, the mechanic is going to fix the car. That's all what you're wanting. That's all what you're seeking. So, if you don't have the knowledge, the knowledge is in the Quran and the Sunnah. If you don't know how to get the specific knowledge you're seeking, ask someone who does. This is the way it should go. The Quran says, فَاسْأَلُوا أَهْلَ الذِّكْرِ إِن كُنْتُمْ لَا تَعْلَمُونَ And there are so many things that we do not know about how to run and manage our family. Uh, I hope that through the course we got together, Sister Ghani and maybe others, that those issues become more clear how important it is to set our family on the right platform and never depart that platform. You have to marry right, you have to choose right, you have to go through the right process to get married, and you have to work with your husband to understand what marriage is for you and for him. This is what the period of engagement is all about. So the first word we wanted to explain is the foundation. And we explain the opposite, that if you skip from the foundation being the Quran and the Sunnah, you are living according to your whims and desires, and those are not fixed. Those change one week after the other, by one idea from here, one from there, they change. The only thing fixed and stable in this life is Allah. 
So if you want peace, hold on to his rope, the book. If you want safety, keep holding to that book. If you want success, never leave loose that book. This is what the Quran is saying. The Quran is saying, وَاَعْتَصِمُوا بِحَبْلِ اللَّهِ جَمِيعًا So the union of the man and the woman in the context of family is very solid and very strong when each one of them is holding to that rope and never thinks to leave that rope one second. The idea of the Quran being described as a rope, in fact, is to tell us what the Quran is saying. إِنَّ الْإِنسَانَ لَفِي خُسْرٍ All humans are in loss. Except for who? إِلَّا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَعَمِلُوا الصَّالِحَاتِ Except for those who believed and did what is righteous. So if all men are at loss and in loss, except for people who do believe and do righteous deeds, what does this mean? What is the ayah he referring to? It's referring to people who are holding to the rope of Allah. وَعَتَصِمُوا بِحَبْلِ اللَّهِ the image, if I may relate it to you, is like a person who has been picked up from a flooding area by a helicopter. How do they pick them up? They put down a rope, right? And they let them hold on. If they leave the rope, what happens to them? That's exactly the image. If that settles in our heart and mind and soul, there is no way that you want to pass a day without holding on to the rope of Allah and making it the center for your life, the center for your thoughts, the, the source of your ideas, and the source of your judgment. Because anything else you use for any of that will pollute your life. So if I get my ideas from writers, authors, philosophers, no matter how great they may be, it may or may not be consistent with the sources that we have as Muslims. It may or may not be. So what happens when it is not consistent with the Quran? It gives me something contrary. So it develops in my head and heart desires and dreams and wants that are not derived from the Quran and the Sunnah. I start polluting my head. I start polluting my heart. I start polluting my soul. So my husband or my wife would come to tell me, let us do this. No, I don't like to do this anymore. Why? Because the head has been polluted. The soul has been polluted. Other desires came in the heart. So we have to be careful not to pollute the pure, pristine source of guidance that Allah has given it to us. And it doesn't make sense, even though most of us would live like this, it doesn't make sense that you send your child to a polluted water to swim and then say, oh, every 10 minutes I will get him out and I will wash him through, right? Or I will bathe him. But then you send him back to the same. Then you wash him. Then you send him back. Does anybody live like this? What does this reflect? It is worse than someone who is just uh, steering an empty pot. It's worse because you're exposing your child to something bad. Now take this example to us as adults because most of us actually act like children. We, we do not overcome the child's habits very quickly. Some of us never uh, mature above child habits because they become very entrenched. So if we take this example to us adults, you are raised in your home and you are used to habits and things in your own environment and then you get married and then your husband or your wife will tell you, but in my family this is the way we do it because we think this is Islam. What basis do you use to do it this way? Oh, that's how I grew up and that's the way it's going to be. Well, what does this mean? It means that that spouse is breaking away from the foundation of the family. Because the foundation of the family is to follow the Quran and follow the Sunnah. I believe that this issue 
now is covered. Anybody has a question on this? Anybody has other questions? Remember, I said in the beginning that I will be talking on either principles or guidance for like 20 minutes or so, and we will be putting them into practice by examples, and then we will take questions to discuss more practical issues that concern you. So I want to devote the rest of the time for your questions, yes. I guess to start, my question would be, um, let's say you understand that, because I, I get a lot of questions from sisters that, okay, you, you understand what you're saying, but then maybe your husband's on a different journey, different plane, different, how do you now go up to him and say, okay. Very good question. But, you know, that's the tough part. Yes. People act based on what? Does anybody want to help me with this? People act based on what? What makes me act in a certain way? Based on, hmm? based on their belief. Based on their belief. And how does belief become a motive for action? Hmm? How they were raised. How they were raised. I want to discuss the first issue. How does belief, you said belief is yes. the primary motive for acting in a certain way. Yes. I agree, yes. but I want to know... As I, if you go back to your uh, discussion, belief means like as you take it, for example, you believe and you tell yourself, as let me say the husband, your wife is for granted so you can go back home and fend it, your anger. Yes. It's something you took it for as a belief, as like you believe it, you believe in it, unless you get knowledge or... Unless you correct it. So the example you're giving is personality. Is is belief but not as faith. <laughs> not as a faith. No, no, I'm saying you said belief. Yes. So I want to discuss this because it's at the at the heart of the issue. Belief generally refers to a person's faith. But the example you give is very eloquently bringing other type of belief, which is I believe that my wife will never do anything. Yes. That also is a belief, right? But this belief is not a faith belief. This is an idea. People get their ideas from where? Because in my action, I follow ideas more than I follow my belief. Culture, right? And... And culture, okay, media. and? Somebody say media. No. Media is a source of information. Yeah, I think it's so, media. and it, it's, it's a source of developing my culture because it affects me, okay, by affecting my ideas. But it is, culture is a source, what else? Well, what you see. Maybe the temperament at the moment, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. It can also trigger me behaving in a way that's different from my nature. Right? Some people act, at the moment, impulsive. Right? Mm -hmm. So that also becomes a source of a motive for my action. Okay? So what else can become a motive for my action other than my belief, my ideas, and my feeling and circumstances? You're right, but when do we get to do this? I want you to stop, reflect, and think with me. When you get married, when you get ready to get married, and you start receiving suggestions and proposals and stuff like this, this is the moment you check to see if that person is on the same page or reading from a different book. That's the time to do it. Anyone who crossed that bridge and is already married, it is like somebody who jumped in an ocean and wanting then to see as he is in the ocean the circumstances of his swimming 
and how he deals with those circumstances. I'm not saying there is no hope if you're married, but I'm saying so that you teach your children that the time to make that determination is not after marriage. Yes. So with this, I get a lot of questions about this. I want to ask, um, what advice would you give to people in that situation at that time? A lot of, a lot of um, people in Washington, the DMV area, they don't have access to a wali, or maybe even the wali doesn't even, the wali doesn't even. No, yes. Themselves. So what practical advice would you give to those people? Very so simple. How would you see those signs? Very simple. Number one, do not judge a person by what they say. I will repeat it again. Do not judge the bachelor person coming to marry you or your daughter by what they say. Judge them by their behavior. Because as we said, if you want to know his faith, his behavior should reflect it. If his behavior doesn't reflect it, then faith for such a person may be only an idea in his head, but not a way of life that you're seeking. Am I missing anybody in that? No, you are actually at the point. Yeah. How would you, most of the culture, the most of the families we know, when they see it is like a, it's a word of mouth, like saying, oh, so so knows. The word of that mouth. Son is good. I know where you're heading. Mm -hmm. The word of mouth is only a suggestion, but don't take it as a binding judgment. First, because it's not your judgment. It's not your judgment. So don't use it as if it were your own judgment. It's not. Second, because people would recommend the people that they know and people that they don't. We know this from life, right? People would recommend the people on basis and reasons other than your own. So never take somebody's recommendation, including the Imam, as a judgment that you should live by. Why? Especially for the Imam, because everybody treats the Imam differently. And people in the masjid in general are in their best shape, right? So the only time the Imam can benefit you with a solid advice if he says, this guy is a troublemaker. Because the Imam should never say this unless he knows the person in a situation that this person is a real troublemaker. So you can take his negative recommendation, but not his positive, because how could I know somebody more than he comes, he prays, he looks nice, he talks nice with me. But we know better, all of us. We know that people treat each other worse than how they treat the Imam. Right? So the Imam's judgment in matters of recommendation should only be taken if it is strongly negative. But if it is hesitantly negative, forget it. So the way to judge and the time to judge is not after marriage. Then you say, but not every sister here has a family and a chaperone and a wali. That is true. If you don't have a wali, choose a wali. Someone that you know well, someone who's honest, who protects your privacy and who cares for your interest. And this should be the person. And someone who is old in age to have life experience as to how to guide you in this process. Definitely don't choose a bachelor, someone who's not married. Definitely don't choose someone who himself can become your own husband. Choose someone who is clearly married, stable, wise, old, and with good knowledge Islamically. Don't tell me that there is none. There is. Okay? But even with that, you have the right to meet that person within the context of other families, okay, if you are living by yourself, and to sail the process of getting to know each other. And we will talk one time, inshallah, about the process of marriage and how it 
should start, how it should be led. Yes. Yes. Uh, thank thank you. You. Uh, so I have a question about um, faith, actually. So um, I read recently in a hadith about the three levels of faith, Islam, Iman, and Isa. Yes. And I have a question about, are, are those like developmental stages? Like you, uh, so how do you know that your children are, are growing in their faith? And then um, with your, your significant other, how do you ensure that, um, that you are both moving toward like, Increasing Iman or Isan. Let's take the first point first. How do you make sure that your children are growing in Islam? Your children give you clear signals that most of us miss. So your child goes to school and she had a week, the first week of school. And then she comes back home and says, Mom, even though the school is full of Muslim kids, but none of them cares to pray. None of the girls care to dress properly. Why do we have to do it? They are all Muslims and they are good girls, good boys. Why do we have to do it? Then another neighbor's girl comes back home and she says, Mom, Unfortunately, none of the kids I have in the school pray. I ask them. And the girls, they don't want to dress hijab. I feel sorry for them. Both girls are saying one and the same thing. But one of them is happy she is a Muslim. And the other one laments that she is a Muslim. She regrets being a Muslim. So the way your child reflects on your values vis-a-vis -vis the values of his class or her class shows you if they appreciate your values that they learn at home vis-a-vis -vis the values they learn at school the habits and the customs they learn at school so the children give us clear signals of where their heart is it's only that we miss those signals and we look for giving our kids comfort. That's okay, honey. Maybe Allah will guide them. Something comforting. But we don't care enough to go beyond the words to talk with our kids about what they know about Islam. Why do they love it? Why do you think that those kids are right? Because this is a discussion when you get to know. It's about the kids. The second question was, Yes, 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 yes. You're yes. Growing in your faith. Yes. If you want to know if you and all your spouse are growing in faith, look for where both of you are traveling. If reaching Allah is our destiny, this is where I want, and I see myself every day growing closer to Him, I do more prayer. I do a lot of charitable works, volunteering. I reach out to classes to learn my faith. I surround myself with people who are knowledgeable and beneficial to my faith. I try to help those who need my help. If I see myself doing this and my spouse is doing the same in his own circles, then we are both heading in one and the same direction. If I see disparity in what he is doing and what I am doing, then everybody is traveling in their own direction. Does this answer the question? So, we have eight, 10 minutes for a comma? Okay, we can take more questions, yes. Uh, if we don't judge like a person uh, by like what they say or what the people say about him, like how can I judge? You judge by what you know not what you hear. And don't pay much attention to what people say in that context. Why? Everybody wants to show himself or herself as an angel. Imagine I am coming to sell you my car. Would I start off by telling you what's wrong with it? It doesn't make sense. 
I'm not selling the car if I do that. What about if I am selling myself to you for you to buy? I'm telling you I'm the best husband you can have. Would I start off by showing you or telling you how bad I am? My past marriages are awful. I did this to my ex and all. nobody does that. So what people say is not normally a representative of truth. Then you ask, how do I judge? I said, judge by behavior. Then you say, when do I see his behavior? Oh, there's a lot of ways to do this. Information you get from people, I'm not saying throw it up or throw it away. All what I'm saying is absorb from it what is consistent and what is not so that you can judge if the person recommending is consistent. Maybe they have animosity, they give you the worst information. Maybe this is a relative and they give you only the pure, pristine picture, an image. Neither one of those can be fit for recommendation. Okay, so what you need to do is use what you get of information with a bag of salt. Definitely, that is my recommendation, because unless you know the person, you will never be able to establish a fair or good judgment about his character, his faith, and his life. So short engagements, you have to do istikhara before you make the decision, but you have to know what you're making istikhara about first. It is like, if I want, to, again, I use the car, if I want to buy a car, before I go to any agency to buy the car, I need to collect information about what is the best car for my money. Right? So you need to collect this information first. Yes? A lot of sisters take shahad, new shahadas, and they would like to get married, but it's so hard, how would they go on finding a husband just from the beginning, or what process would you advise, advise them to go through? Two things to mention. We keep calling a person a new Muslim even after they have been Muslim for 10 years. We need to stop that. No, I'm talking about Muslims. No, no, I'm making a point. Oh, okay. I'm just making a point. Uh, the other issue is I do not advise fresh young Muslim sisters to rush into marrying any Muslim. Because most of these marriages end up failing. Why? Because there's a huge disparity. Someone who is discovering what it means to be a Muslim, yet, and the other person has known what is it to be a Muslim for a long time, and he has made up his mind, and he may use a religion to manipulate this not knowing enough fresh Muslim sister. So I'm against rushing a new Muslim sister into marriage. Even if she asks, I'll tell her, wait. Okay? But then when she's ready, she then wait When she's ready, it means for me that she's learned her faith enough to know that she is not vulnerable for manipulation. <coughs> she's not vulnerable for manipulation. So the husband coming, whoever that may be, is not going to tell her, but that's Islam, I'm born Muslim, and all of that, pulling all of these tricks, is not going to work for her. Because she has learned some of the Quran to immunize herself against potential manipulation. Second, she should never get married without a chaperone or somebody that can act like her wali from the inside of the community. Somebody who knows who's there, what they are doing, their history, he can fend for her into getting to know that person. Because many of us unfortunately think that the wali is somebody to come and sign for the contract. That's not the function of the wali. What's the function of the wali, Sister Ghania? No, no, just to add to your... Uh, no, 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 I want you to answer my question, please. The function of the wali is, number one, to 
find out who is the person. Is it? Is it? Uh, uh, no. Yes, to filter, to filter the information exactly coming before. about the person and from the person. From the person and being, you know, the act for the... To act, yeah, to act for the woman. on her behalf yeah. and to protect her interest. Protect her interest. Yes. I was just adding to yours yes. and I think I recommend and highly recommend I always say when I took our class for the our family, one on one, even though one or two we are still with it. Sure. Uh, every woman or every daughter or men or women, it is better before they start marriage to know their deen, yes. to know their faith, yes. rights, and responsibility. Because that class, I've said m many times, even though I've been married 15 years, I say, I wish I took that class before I get married, yeah. before I even start getting married. So it's this uh, is Anissa. It's recommended. So that class is available for yes. us. Yes. And our teacher is Sheikh Shafi. Very, very good, very good foundation, very good preparation for marriage covers. Even where, even parents can come to, to build their, because we don't know our team. Yes. So in that class, I, I highly recommend it. Every daughter, every mother, every man wants to get married. Yes, sister. Uh, Shafi. Um, most of us here are kind of parents, most of us. Yes. Uh, some, some people may still looking yes. to get married. Some yes. of us, we are worried for our young uh, children. children. It's very hard to get married in this environment. Um, <clears throat> our youth is having trouble finding the right person, finding a marriage. So, um, let alone shopping and choosing and looking, there's, there's nothing much to pick and choose. So is there anything that we can do as here, the masjid and the parents? First, let us cover what we can very quickly. That is teaching our children what Islam is and what marriage is about. Qualify them. This is the first important step. Okay? If that step is covered, we can work many mechanisms to get people to know each other or discover each other, okay? It goes as simple as name listing with basic information, which we have a website for, even though it's not functional yet, but I hope that with your pressure, we can get it to move forward, okay? To as little as just listing names and ages and let people post their phone numbers. The risk with that second method is there will be a lot of harassment that comes from unknown sources. And there could be chances for dating between boys and girls who are in the age of marriage that they may find dating a good substitute. So I recommend that we make private lists of girls we know and boys we know and circulate this in trusted circles to people we know they are looking for. And I hope that Sister Iman will, will, will help with that and others, inshallah. I just, I just want to say, the, we have about maybe four, three, four minutes left. Um, so I just wanted to ask you, we're going to meet every two weeks, inshallah, in this room. So uh, I wanted to ask you, this is a series, I want to ask you what the next series is so they know what the topic is, so the next part of the series. So this will take us about six to nine months. Oh, mashallah. Okay. Okay. That's great. Um, okay. But we will not stop taking your questions on the topic or outside of the topic okay. so that we can address all issues. The, I, I, the other thing was the date. I just want to make sure um, we, have a, we have a choice of two days. Today, Thursday, Mother Toshat, or possibly Wednesday. Can we do this discussion next week? Oh, uh, because well, the next time. Yeah, because the next time, because we want to catch Aisha. Okay. So we will continue in two weeks from now on Thursday. Thursday. So for now it is the second Thursday.